My name is Paul Heidenreich. I am professor of medicine at Stanford University, and I'm here with Dr. Beacon Boscourt, professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, and we're here to discuss the 2022 heart failure guideline. I served as chair, Beacom served as vice chair, and on behalf of the writing committee, we'd like to present to you some of the highlights uh, from that guideline. We updated or actually wrote a whole new guideline because the original guideline was back in 2013 with an update in 2017. And since that time, there's been multiple studies impacting the care of heart failure patients. And we felt it was important to have the guideline reflect those changes in care. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Dr. Boscart to give you some highlights from the guideline. Thank you, Paul. The guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction now includes four classes of medications, including SGLT2 inhibitors, in addition to beta blockers, mineralocortical receptor antagonists, RAS inhibition with ARNI, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs. We have a new class 2A recommendation for use of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Uh, weaker class 2B recommendations are made for ARNI, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, MRA, and beta blockers in this population of patients with heart failure with mildly reduced EF. We also have new recommendations for patients with heart failure with preserved EF, including a class 2A recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitors, and class 2B recommendations with MRAs, ARNI, and ARB in this population. Improved ejection fraction is used to those patients with a previous ejection fraction in the HEFREF range, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction range, who subsequently has have an ejection fraction exceeding that of 40%. These patients, those with improved ejection fraction, should be continued with therapy for heart failure with reduced EF. We also have new recommendations for cardiac amyloidosis, including screening for monoclonal light chains, bone scintigraphy, genetic sequencing, tetramere stabilizing therapy, and anticoagulation. So another uh, highlight of the guideline were value statements. Uh, these were created for select recommendations where there was high quality published evidence on cost effectiveness. And for those recommendations, a value statement uh, was uh, defined as either high value, intermediate, or low value. We also felt it was important uh, that there be evidence supporting increased filling pressures uh, for the diagnosis of heart failure when the LF ventricular ejection fraction was greater than 40%. We make recommendations that this in evidence for increased filling pressure can be obtained from either non-invasive means, such as natriuretic peptide levels, or diastolic function on imaging, or from invasive testing. Another highlight was that patients with advanced heart failure who wish to prolong survival uh, should be referred to a team specializing in heart failure. Uh, this team not only would uh, help with the heart failure management and assess suitability for advanced heart failure therapies, but they would also provide palliative care uh, when that was consistent with a patient's goals of care. Primary prevention is an important part of the guideline for those at risk for heart failure, known as stage A, as well as for those with pre-heart failure, known as stage B. And finally, we had many recommendations for patients with heart failure and certain comorbidities, such as iron deficiency anemia, hypertension, sleep disorders, type two diabetes, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, and malignancy. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Beacom uh, for some closing comments. Thank you, Paul. We encourage everybody to check out the guidelines. We have additional recommendations, uh, uh, figures and tables, which we think are gonna be very useful to our clinicians to be able to implement the guidelines and help us advance the care for our heart failure patients. Thank you.